So the American dream overseas is something that represents a migration, a cultural migration. The American dream uh, started with California. And it started out as the California dream. The Beach Boys song, California Dreamin'. Oh no, that's the Mamas and the Papas, California Dreamin'. And um, how do you know that? I sang that in middle school choir. Wow, that's great. So California Dreaming uh, was so successful that it expanded and became the American Dream. And the American Dream, which is uh, in large part mythological, right? it, it emerged in the post-war expansion, the Great Acceleration, as we've called it in the past, the, the rapid expansion of everything uh, in the world, but especially leading uh, in the United States, uh, it um, there was a real estate boom in California, and we think of California as being a place of palm trees and the good life. So when the Spanish arrived, well, we're gonna. That's going back too far. That, we're going to talk about that next week, because next week's theme is all about uh, Los Angeles as a really important reference point for understanding the world. Now remember, we're going back in time. The goal is for everyone here to be uh, very effective and have a big impact in the profession and beyond the profession in your careers uh, 20 years from now. Right? It's the 2030s is our target decade for you guys to turn things around and really improve the situation. So we're using history as a means of getting a handle on what can be turned around, how we might be able to use architecture to turn things around. So the first question on this sheet has to do with what can get into the heart what can architecture do now for better or worse and I think for worse most architectural history the tradition and practice of teaching architectural history tends to fall into the pattern of claiming that if you want to understand the Renaissance if you want to understand um, Greece and Rome just look at its architecture, because its architecture is a very clear imprint of the cultural, economic, political, social forces that are operating in the society. And so we tend, in the way we teach history, we tend to reinforce the sense that architecture is a reflection, a passive outcome. So forces happen over here in the real world and they manifest secondarily as a secondary phenomenon. They manifest in architecture. What if there is architecture that actually performs in a much more active way? What if architecture were actually an instrument for transforming the world? Can you think of any examples where architecture is actually a vehicle for driving change. The library parks, the library parks Medellin. in Medellin. How about other things that we haven't even talked about in this class? Yeah. Kind of like think about the, like you said, that kind of went right to like the Great Pyramids because of like, it was like a change in time. Change system thinking. Well, is, are the Great Periods a, a reflection of a, of a change in thinking? Yeah. Are they more than just a, a reflection? Could they possibly be more than just a reflection of forces that were operating? Yeah. Well, how? How could they be? Like the pyramids of Giza like, line up with the stars. It's like an astronomical thing. Mm -hmm. Would that be sort of the same? Well, force? Uh, the ruler at the time, the pharaoh at the time, we don't know. But it could be that the pharaoh at the time said, I need to alter the balance between heaven and earth. And I can't do it 
just with my bare hands. I need uh, a pyramid to, as an instrument of altering the relationship between the heavens and the earth. So that's a very literal instrumentation, using architecture as an instrument for negotiating change in the world. And that's actually the big topic that we end this semester with. We go back to how architecture, uh, one of the understandings of how architecture and cities formed throughout history is as an instrument of cosmological uh, scale that in order to alter the relationship between humans and uh, whatever gods you uh, believe in, you need architecture to change the relationship. Now, even if the kings uh, weren't sure if it actually had that impact, there's another level of instrumentality to that, is that maybe the pharaoh said, I need to demonstrate to the population in order to establish and consolidate my power over society, over Egypt, I need to clearly demonstrate that I'm a powerful dude and that I'm in direct communication with the gods. What better way to, to demonstrate that and convince people that, it, that it's absolutely true without them questioning it than some huge manifestation like the pyramids? Which brings us back to Medellin. Until Fajardo did the library parks, he was just another pop, uh, populist candidate and then uh, mayor, just another, another politician spouting promises to get elected, right? He had to demonstrate through architecture that he meant what he was saying. And it was very convincing. So convincing that no one can get elected to mayor without saying something similar. Whether they mean it or not, uh, they still have to say something similar. And so this first question is getting at this key question that lies at the core of what we do in studio and what we do in the profession is are we just uh, the servants of the wealthy and powerful? Do we just uh, satisfy their demand for uh, expressions of power and wealth? Um, we certainly are that. That is the traditional role of architecture. It is to serve the interests of the powerful and the wealthy, to passively reflect their greatness back to them and outward to the rest of the world. Um, but can architecture do more than that? The, the evidence of today's lecture suggests that we do do more than that uh, on a very negative level, that architecture isn't just a passive reflection of the wealth and power of nations, billionaires, etc. It is also an instrument of producing that wealth and power. So not unlike the pharaohs of Egypt, architecture, uh, given what I'm proposing to you, and you're, I'm asking you to verify or correct this theory in your dealing with the evidence for next Wednesday. Could it be that, as this story suggests, as the reading suggests, and as this lecture suggests, could it be that architecture plays a significant role in accumulating the wealth of the very wealthy, of actually becoming an instrument for amplifying the wealth, of supplementing the wealth, of expanding the wealth uh, collection abilities of the very powerful people of the world. What do you think? Are you skeptical or do you think it might be possible? <laughs> Yeah, so we'll see. So I, um, I think it's important to engage this topic uh, and every topic in, in your education with a certain degree of, of skepticism. Uh, I will attempt to convince you 
uh, of my interpretation of the evidence. But the world cannot afford for Wentworth Institute of Technology to turn out replicants of, um, of its faculty. We need strong, independent thinkers who question the evidence, who question the interpretations um, that, we, uh, that we suggest in class. We need active collaborators who can help us get the story straight. And so I'm using this course uh, to enlist you in a collaborative effort to verify, correct, refine, counter, argue with, but to try to engage, because it's very lonely to try to pursue these topics. Um, I'd rather, I'd feel a lot better pursuing these topics if I had other people checking my work to make sure I'm getting it right. So I am asking you for your, for your active engagement in this topic. So we're going back to the first lecture. This is the situation of our era. Uh, your career space occupies the last few decades of this great explosion, the great wall, the great demographic wall leading to peak human. That's a, a name I made up. So if you hear someone else say it, let me know, because they have to pay me a nickel. So we're leading up to peak human around 2060, when you will be uh, taking control of the world. Right? That's the plan, right? Unless you take control of the world earlier. Let's see. You'll be actually you'll be retiring then, won't you? Well, no. You how old will you be in 2060? 63. Yeah, 63. So. Um, You'll be tired and kind of checked out. But let's talk about 2050 then. You'll be 53, right? If you're going to take, take over control of the world, it's going to be somewhere in, in the 2050s. And if you're going to be on a trajectory to taking over control and having a say in how things go, it's going to be established earlier in your career. So. That's the thing to think about, is we're preparing you for that, because we're Wentworth and we prepare you for career success. So it used to be that we were freaked out about population, and population was the big scary bomb. We called it a population bomb back in the 60s and 70s. But I want to encourage you to be comfortable uh, about population. There's nothing that we're going to do that's going to alter significantly this unless we pull back on girls and women's education. We have to stay on task, especially in Africa, with the education of girls and women. That's the only way we're going to cap it at 10 billion peak human. So keep your eye on that. But uh, other than that, don't worry about population. Worry about consumption. So remember this, when Hans Rosling said, he gave us this great dramatic portrayal of uh, the great acceleration, how capitalism is actually doing a pretty good job and international economic growth is doing a pretty good job of spreading the benefits of modern advancement and capitalist economic growth. It's doing a pretty good job of spreading the wealth uh, from what we used to call the first world to the third world. So much so that we don't use the term third world anymore. We actually call it the developing world. And we're going to dig into a little bit more about the Hans Rosling story. Um, what really matters, it turns out, is consumption. So let's get the sound on. developing countries, we had large families, and they had relatively short lives. Now, what has happened since 1962? We, we saw that, right? Mm -hmm. So here's a new one. 
consumption is what matters. World population is expected to reach about 9 billion by 2050. Who cares? It's 10 billion by 2060 and stays there. In other words, almost 8 billion people will be in the developing world. The thing is, the actual number of people is not in itself an issue. No big deal. Except in some very densely settled countries. Even there, not a big deal. In fact, you could fit the entire population of the world into the state of Texas, although not very comfortably. In world population terms, what this really is matters important. is a simple ratio, 32 to 1. It represents consumption, and this is where our problems begin. The average rates at which we consume resources, such as oil and metals, and produce waste, like plastic and greenhouse gases, are about 32 times higher in North America, Western Europe, Japan and Australia than they are in the developing world. 32 to 1 captures the difference in consumption between the first world and the third world. This little ratio has Shouldn't. huge consequences. Let me explain. The estimated 1 billion people who live in the developed world have a relative per capita consumption rate of 32. Most of the world's other 5.5 billion people in the developing world have a rate well below 32, mostly near to 1. This means that with 10 times the population, the United States consumes 320 times more resources than, for example, Kenya does. The poor of the world logically want to have our standards of living. But the fact is that the planet simply does not have sufficient resources to support such a dream. And so, we're left with a fundamental problem. If the whole developing world were to catch up with us, world consumption rates would increase 11-fold. It would be as if the world had a population of 72 billion people. We may see China's growing consumption as a problem. But the Chinese and many, many others are only reaching for the consumption rate we already have. Telling them they cannot or should not try would be hypocritical, immoral, self-serving, and futile as it wouldn't work. What we should be trying to do is to make consumption rates and living standards more equal around the world, and to do it at a level the planet can sustain. The question is, how can we do this? So, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's kind of simplistic, though. I summarize it typically this way, that if everyone, and we're talking peak human now, if at peak human everyone had the lifestyle of the United States, we would need something like four or five planet Earths. That's what it would take to support peak human at U.S. level consumption rates, current U.S. level consumption rates. Uh, at the same time, if uh, everyone in the world instead uh, were able to live happily and uh, productively at a consumption rate equal to India, which is not bad, right? Who's a vegetarian here? Any vegetarians? Have you ever uh, tried it? If everyone lived like they do in India. And the big, the big uh, changes are three changes. First, vegetarianism. Boom, that is huge. An even bigger one that's going to play a prominent role in this course, that they don't drive automobiles, private automobiles, by and large. That's changing rapidly. But the average Indian citizen does not have a private automobile. Another huge factor in the impact on the planet. And the third one has to do with heating and air conditioning of buildings, the resources around buildings. Those are the three huge factors that impact uh, are the, the, the total impact. So if everyone in the world lived the way Indian people do, vegetarian, no car, a lot less heating and cooling, then the planet could support 30 billion people. 10 billion would be no problem. There'd be plenty of room for uh, lots of people to consume much more and some people to consume much less. Uh, so it could, the Earth could support 30 billion people. 
uh, so two very, very distinct scenarios. Now we get into the hard part. The whole world will never have an even level of consumption evenly distributed everywhere. Fine, that's easy to, to grasp. The difficult thing to grasp, especially uh, because we consume these types of statistical things, Hans Rosling and everybody, we talk about the wealth of nations. We talk about the economic and consumption level of entire nation states. Well, are we uniformly, here in the United States, do we have a uniform level of wealth and consumption? No. Did we ever? No. Has it ever been more uniform than it is now? Yes. In the post-war period between the, uh, 1945 and 1970, we had, a, during the first phase of the Great Acceleration, there was a thing that was justifiably called the middle class. There was a huge expansion of wealth creation in the population of the United States, as long as you were white. That's an important footnote in almost everything I say about the post-war period in the United States. Are you saying there's like no middle class today? Well, to call it a middle class is problematic because it's not in the middle. Uh, but we'll, that's going to be the focus of next week. So we're looking at, as we go back in time, we're now looking at the American dream overseas and its impacts. We go from that to the American dream in America next week. So we'll be looking at that much more carefully. But all of this stuff is about nations. Do you think China is uniformly uh, well off? Not even close. So Hans Rosling, to his credit, has looked at not just the aggregate statistics of the entire nation, but looking at the income, income wealth distribution as a proxy for quality of life and well-being and consumption levels. And so even in these terms, he notices that there's a great shift towards, uh, so this is looking at the distribution of benefits uh, in terms of population. So this hump, this two hump of the 70s globally has moved to a single hump, which is good. Which is why we don't use the term third world so much. Because the inequities no longer distribute country by country, is, is what it seems. But it, within each country, um, each country is becoming more like every other country, where they, the uh, highest, the richest people in Bangladesh are coming close to the richest people in Pakistan, uh, and the richest people in South Africa, and the richest people in the United States. The, the wealthiest people of the world in China are all becoming more or less in the same category of high degree of wealth, while the most impoverished are also converging. So the third world is becoming less of a global pattern of distribution to a local pattern of distribution. And in some places, hint, hint, this is an excellent, if you can see the architectural manifestation of this in an image for Wednesday, if you see the wealthiest 1% in their architecture in the foreground, and the poorest 60% living in formal settlements in the background, you capture this phenomena in an architectural analysis. That would be really wonderful. And they do exist some places in the world. And so that's, uh, so the bottom line here is wealth inequality is getting better and better in terms of nations. Uh, which I'm going to complicate that with a video that comes up very shortly. Um, but it's getting worse and worse in every place. Every city, every country in the world, wealth inequality is getting more and more extreme. Have you seen any of the videos, the viral videos about wealth distribution? Do you know who Richard, uh, Robert Reich is? 
he's got, uh, he was the labor secretary for Bill Clinton. And he's got a very popular um, YouTube channel, and he wrote a book called Saving Capitalism. He's, he's a committed capitalist. He says, capitalism is great, and we need to use it uh, to help everybody in the world the way it's supposed to work, according to Adam Smith. So we have to stop it from doing, creating these wealth inequalities. So it's a very, I think, very optimistic. And his book, Saving Capitalism, is a really interesting reference point for this topic. So here's a complication of that. And I'm confused a bit, but I'm going to show it to you anyway, um, just to see if we can figure this out. Okay, I'm going to have to start this over. Well, basically, it goes like this. I'll, I'll narrate this. So we talk a lot about wealth inequality in the United States, but let's look at wealth inequality around the world. And there's a viral video about wealth inequality in the United States. This is a companion piece that came later based on UN statistics. And basically what the experiment is, it was conducted first by uh, economics professors in, at Harvard. If you look at, and this is typically the way we do it, we look at the, each 20% quintile. These are quintiles because there's five of them. And we look at how much wealth is held by the wealthiest quintile compared to the others. And so 94, in the, and globally, according to the United Nations, the richest... 20% uh, of humans on the planet own 94% of the wealth. The rest of the 6% of the wealth is shared by the other 80% of humans. 2% of the humans have something like 50% of the wealth of the whole world. Now let's look at it another way. If, there, if the whole world population were represented in 100 people, lined up, the wealthiest person to the poorest person, and you look at the quintiles, the lowest quintile has only half a percent of the world's wealth, while the richest, 1%, have 43% of the entire wealth. That's what it looks like. So the poorest, 80% of the people share 6% of global wealth, while, and the richest 300 people in the world control the same amount of wealth as the poorest 3 billion people. So 300 people, enough people to fill a jet, have the same amount of wealth as the poorest 3 billion people, which was the entire global population when I was born. And these 300 people live all over the world. And so these wealth inequalities are uh, distributed. If you're looking at nation states, things look great. It looks very even, but within the places, it's very different. And this is looking at the wealthiest members of society used to own 3%, three times as much wealth as the poorest, but that's grown to 350 times the poorest. This is about balance of payments between countries um, that is valuable in and of itself, but it's uh, kind of beyond the point of this lecture, so I'm going to skip forward. I knew how to do that. Is everybody okay? So that's the background for all this. Um, so now let's get to the topic of the reading. Uh, when I graduated from college, uh, the economy was booming, and I had some great internships for three years in New York City and San Francisco. But then uh, there was uh, an economic downturn, and architecture firms were laying off people right and left, uh, and it moved across the country from the East Coast to the West Coast. And at the same time, I was really fascinated. I, originally, I learned Italian, and I was going to go to Italy to study urban form and how it works in, uh, in relationship to culture. 
But by some fluke, uh, long story short, I ended up instead on the island of Java. There is an island, it's called Java. And it's in the country of, what country is it in? Indonesia. Yeah. So you read the reading, you saw the author's names. Uh, so you know the story somewhat. And when I got there, I was like, wow, what is going on here? This is strange. And so this is me, this, this reading was me figuring that out in the context of doing a PhD at MIT. Um, so Jakarta, this was the really interesting thing. In the 1970s, the Dutch, who used to be the colonial power that controlled all of these islands, came back and they said, you know what, we'd really like to help out, uh, help you get back on your feet, you independent nation of Indonesia. Uh, by the way, we're, we're sorry for the 350 years of colonial oppression. Um, I, how can we make it up to you? And so they sent their planners and they said, your city of Jakarta is a very sensitive, uh, has very sensitive water table issues. And these, these hills to the south are very sensitive water catchment areas. You probably shouldn't develop much there. And the coastline, mangroves, uh, flooding, very sensitive balance between salt water and fresh water, you probably shouldn't develop there. But this stretch here, the flat uh, alluvial plain, that has good water supply, um, it's safe, it's stable, that's a good place for you to develop. We can't help but notice, but your zoning regulations are very weak. And we don't think uh, the Dutch approach, which is very legalistic and based on courts and strong government, we, we know that that's probably not something you're going to be able to recreate. So here's what we suggest. We suggest, and also, you have a big population and it's growing really fast. We don't think that building freeways and roads is a good strategy. We suggest instead that you put lots of investment in rail infrastructure. Rail, buses, water supply, sewage treatment, drainage in this east-west corridor. And if you invest in lots of infrastructure in this east-west pattern, you can, that, that's where all the growth will be attracted to. And you can always stretch it across the island of Java as long as, as far as you need to go. It's the same size as California. Just keep that going, that rail infrastructure, right across the island. It was a brilliant scheme. The Indonesian government uh, did a big planning report in the 70s and uh, reinforced it in the 80s and the 90s. And they said, they started with this, they said, there are three paradigms. We could either do what the British do, which is build these independent new towns outside of Jakarta with green belt buffer zones. And we'll look at that as we move back in history. Or we could do these fingers of development where we have infrastructure corridors so that the city spreads out in fingers with green preserves in between. Uh, so that we protect our water supply and have some recreational area. Or we could do what the Dutch suggest, is have one finger going down and uh, really focus our development in an east-west corridor. Yeah? What's the scale of those diagrams? Like, is that like a city scale or an island? Well, the island of Java, so here you see this corresponds, this okay. is about the same. The island of Java is the size of California, and it, it goes like this. Then there's Madura, and Bali is over here. Okay. So it's about 160 million people. It's the size of California, but much, much, but huge population density. But people live, it's tropical paradise. People live in very small houses because they live most of the time outside. And so you fly over it, looks like it's empty agricultural land, but it's got a higher population density than Boston, than the Boston region. So Boston would fit, it's, it's similar to the greater Boston metropolitan area where Boston 
if Boston is here and you see Lawrence and Worcester, it would be over here. So it's very similar in scale to Boston, but much higher population. Um, and so, so far so good. And they, the really big important thing is you don't want people to buy cars because it will shut down your economy. You just won't be able to provide enough infrastructure at these population densities. The math just doesn't work. And it's an architectural geom geometry problem. There's just not enough space to park and move cars when your population density is like this. So uh, the military dictator that came into power in 1965 wanted to shift gradually from uh, fear of being murdered by the death squads. He wanted to be a happier, he wanted people to be happier. And so he shifted from a death squad approach towards uh, let's offer the benefits of modern development to people. And so he took a developmentalist approach and he employed lots of architecture, lots of planning, lots of infrastructure development. He sponsored these planning things. And in chapter one of every single one of the planning documents, they reviewed the Dutch analysis and they said, we could do British satellite uh, model or we could do the finger model or we could do the east-west corridor of infrastructure the way the Dutch suggest. And the best one is the Dutch east-west corridor based on rail. But then when you get to chapter two of the planning document, they shift, there's a sudden shift in gears. And they said, so we're going to make new towns outside of Jakarta and connect it with freeways. And we're going to make ring roads, the first ring road, the second ring road, the third ring road. And we're going to develop lots of real estate, uh, high rise towers in the center. So in theory, they're saying, the theoretical model is the Dutch model, but when they go to implement it, they ignore everything they said in chapter one, and they did the exact opposite. Why would they do that? So from the reading, uh, you see that, uh, to make a long story short, is that they take the, uh, there was a large bank, banking industry that they, in the 80s, in the 70s, they went from like three banks controlled by the government. They opened it up to private uh, development. And all of a sudden there were 300 banks. And the 300 banks um, were controlled by people close to the president, his friends and golfing partners. And they were mostly ethnic Chinese, um, wealthy tycoons. Uh, and the next move they did is they invented the real estate market. There was no real estate market. Land was uh, exchanged at very low amounts of money. They had rules uh, in place to prevent big accumulations of land because they wanted to support the traditional purpose of land, which was uh, family arrangements involving weddings and, and in the culture in the, in the villages, there was a very important role for land. And when land changed hands, it was for a modest amount of money that regular people could afford. Well, in the 70s, they saw this idea uh, of real estate marketing and development. And all of a sudden, they were able to take this agricultural land that was worth very little money and by putting, drawing it on a map and saying, this is going to be real estate development, all of a sudden the land value could go from a dollar to a thousand dollars. And as soon as you expand the, the value of land, even if you never, even if no money ever changes hands, you can write in your ledger balance that the assets that you hold as a bank just went up a uh, hundred or a thousand fold. And so that was the basis of suddenly a huge movement of lending. Like if you have land that uh, is worth uh, millions of dollars, then you can borrow money to develop that land. 
uh, using the land value itself as collateral. So by establishing this, by this little trick of uh, valuation of land, they were able to generate huge amounts of money on paper, borrow enormous amounts of money internally in Indonesia and overseas, attract foreign investment because foreign investors want to cash in on this. And all of a sudden, uh, it's off to the races. So all I have to do is um, apply for a development permit of this village, bribe the village head to get him to sign an agreement. I don't even have to buy the land from the village. I just have to get government approval that I have exclusive rights to develop this land. And I don't even have to develop it. So I don't even have to kick people off their land. I don't have to buy the land from them. I just have a permit so that I'm the only one who's allowed to develop it. So those land rights that I just established on paper through a few very small bribes are the basis for me now being able to uh, borrow money, millions and millions of dollars, ostensibly to develop the land, but no one's going to check. So I don't actually develop the land. I might buy real estate in Boston, which is exactly what a lot of Indonesian uh, banking families did and they sent their kids to BU to go to college, and they lived in the condo that they had purchased. But there's a lot of... So th this is a whole new world of land and architecture that mobilizes wealth. And it happened in Indonesia in the 70s, and it was well enough established by the early 90s for me to observe it, when I was living there, and then to write about it in the year 2000 and publish this piece in 2002. And, by, and it became even more clear when people started scratching their heads and looking back at the financial collapse of Southeast Asia in 97. Jenny, do your parents talk about this? Sorry? Do your parents talk about the financial collapse of Southeast Asia in 1997? What happened? Um, so, um, my family, we have real estate back in Thailand. So, um, he is like in the period that he developed his business. So, it's like the bank corrupt in Thailand and stuff, economy went down. So, like, it's hard to like sell the buildings, like the room, the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was horrible. Southeast Asia has not yet recovered. So different nations mm -hmm. have done better. Thailand has done pretty well. Mm -hmm. Indonesia, not so much. But basically it was a property bubble. Have you seen The Big Short, the movie The Big Short? It's about the Great Recession in 2007, 2008, based on the mortgage lending bubble in the United States. So it was a similar phenomenon. In the United States... Banks were under pressure to lend more and more money, whether or not people could pay it back. And it created uh, an artificial inflation of housing costs in the United States. And at some point, uh, the bubble burst. The economy collapsed, and uh, this has been your lifetime. You've experienced the impact of that. Fortunately, we're either the economy is going strong now in the United States, or we're part of the next bubble or somewhere in between, right? But hold on to your hats, because who knows what's going to happen. Um, well, that's the same thing happened in Indonesia uh, and throughout Southeast Asia, to a large part uh, caused by the sudden uh, over-evaluation of land value and the leveraging of that land value in corrupt loans that actually did not go anywhere to produce productive capacity of that land. It went to, it went overseas to buy real estate elsewhere. Um, and so you had a lot of empty buildings uh, because things were built um, not based on demand but based on uh, the investment 
the, the role of architecture and land uh, as a property investment. So here's some some analytical images. Um, and in the reading, we can move through this quickly because you had it in the reading. I just want to give you some some images of uh, of what we're talking about. The wealthiest one percent of Indonesians needed some of them needed to move out of the kampung, the informal settlements where they were not welcome. Uh, if they were ethnically Chinese, there was a lot of pressure for them to to leave because. Uh, there's a lot of racism in Indonesia. And uh, so there was some actual demand. And this is where architecture, we assume that architecture satisfies the needs of people, right? Who's with me? Architecture satisfies the needs of people, otherwise it wouldn't happen, right? So, but what needs? It turns out there are two big categories of needs. And I don't have an eraser, do I? The two big categories of needs, and who even knew that there were two categories of needs? But this, <laughs> when we see this kind of evidence, we have to realize that there's, um, there's use value. That is, we assume that architecture serves some purpose, or else it wouldn't get designed and built. But there's a second one, which is called exchange value. If you have a huge amount of money, and you don't need to spend it, um, what do you do with it? You could put it in the bank, right? where it'll collect how much interest in the savings account? Yeah, like really low, like it's lower than inflation. So if you have, let's say you have $1,000, you put it in the bank, um, inflation is rising faster than the interest rate of your savings account. So what do you, where do you put it instead if you don't put it in your savings account? Assets, like non-deteriorating assets. Non-deteriorating assets, like what? Real estate. Real estate. So you could put it in the stock market which has been doing great historically with a few really big ups and downs the last few weeks because of trade warfare. Um, but if you're in the United States, put it, put it in the U.S. stock exchange and a little bit overseas just to diversify. But in Jakarta, there's a stock exchange, but it's not really that great. And they have a banking system, but it's really not that secure. The thing that really looks like a good investment is real estate. So uh, I went to, um, I was living in central Java. I, I rode my bicycle out to one of these real estate subdivisions. And I started talking to people who were just hanging out. Uh, it was pretty empty. Um, and there were people hanging out. And uh, I went uh, and started talking to them, and I said, so uh, do you live here? And they said, yes, we live here. And um, talking to them, it quickly became clear that uh, they were employed as uh, housekeepers and gardeners and security guards um, for families that did not live there. So they were gardeners. Uh, maids, security guards for to k take care of the property but no one lived there was a whole row there, there were a dozen houses on this street and no occupants other than the guards, maids and gardeners uh, and they explained yeah the family that owns the house uh, he bought three of them because he has three children and Every time a child is born, he buys a new house. And then when that child gets married, he sells. The plan was to sell the house at a huge profit and use that money to pay for the wedding, the honeymoon, and to set up uh, 
son or daughter with their spouses in a comfortable lifestyle so that they can prosper uh, in the wealthiest 1%. And so that's why this house or these houses were, were there. And while we're at it, uh, there's the whole cultural thing about the American dream overseas. This is the Arc de Triomphe uh, as the gateway to one of these neighborhoods. This is Mount Rushmore. This little subdivision is called uh, America. This is France. This is Italy. Brunelleschi's El Duomo from uh, your history class in Florence, Italy. The Sphinx, a mixture between the Acropolis in Greece and Athens and the Colosseum in Rome. And this is the visitor center for real estate development, which is called um, Tourism Garden. Uh, and the, the marketing pitch is you can visit the entire world without leaving your gated community. Issei Shrine. So it's almost as if you take every building that you study in history of architecture and you replicate it. You know, you did those sketches in architecture history. You did those sketches. Well, who knew that we were preparing you to be effective architects uh, for these types of developments? But other people have taken the same class that you've taken. Uh, and they've done it all over the world because architectural history is taught the same way throughout Asia. It's a history not of Asia. It's a history of Europe and North America. It's the same history class that you took. This is the marketing brochure for the Beverly Hills uh, housing subdivision. And there's not a single element in here that has anything to do with Indonesia, except, I'm not sure, even that. But basically, it's a Photoshop collage of images imported from overseas. And they do the same thing when they design the architecture. They basically collage images on top of the same buildings. Uh, and as I point out in the reading, uh, the same architecture is clothed in different costumes in order to promote a different image, and it's all for marketing purposes. And so this is Rodeo Drive, which is the main street of Hollywood. And it doesn't look any, Rodeo Drive in California doesn't really look anything like this, except maybe the tile roofs and some of the styles are lifted right out of the um, photography the marketing and design team traveled to uh, Beverly Hills and Hollywood and they they took photographs and then they replicated in their own developments. And so these subdivisions were created throughout the region around Jakarta and connected by ring roads. The first ring road, second, third, fourth, and on and on. And so here's another version of the, of the two things that they were not going to do. They were going to do the Dutch one, which was the linear paradigm, the emphasis on rail, secondary circulation by roads. But here's the one they rejected, which is the concentric paradigm. And even though they rejected it in chapter one, in chapters two, three, and four, they actually embrace it entirely. And so the roads are built by government contracts awarded to friends and family of the president. These are the real estate developments. Some of them are bigger than the city of Jakarta itself. The only reason this one was able to be permitted is that it was a, a water preserve area that was already set aside. Uh, this is Jungol. So in order to preserve uh, the water supply for the city of Jakarta, they put this land in preserve. Uh, thus, it was available for the son of the president to uh, claim as a development uh, based on his trip to Irvine Ranch in Southern California. Before this, Irvine Ranch was the largest single real estate subdivision in history. But this one 
is larger. Basically, the president's son went to California, visited Irvine Ranch, found out who the architects and planners were, hired them to design and plan this version of Irvine Ranch. And I interviewed those guys, and they said, we really wanted to go visit the site, but the client said no. You're not allowed to visit the site. And so they designed it from afar. They never went to the site. They, they stayed in California. They gave the client what they wanted, which was a photocopy of what they had done in Irvine Ranch in California. And in order to uh, create demand or to be able to tell the story that 10 years from now this land is going to be more valuable than it is today, uh, he convinced his father to move the capital of Indonesia from Jakarta to Jonggol. And so when, when the economy collapsed, in part because of all this development in 1997, Suharto, the dictator, was uh, left, he resigned. He was, after 32 years of ruling, uh, he had to step down because there were violent protests all throughout the country. I was there at the time and I, I saw this coming and I quickly went to Singapore. So this, these are the actual houses where I talked to the people and they told me that uh, the owners have never been there. No one lives there but them. The owners have never been there. And these things are also uh, walled, gated enclaves. Um, and here's the paradigm. And we'll, we'll get into this in the LA School lecture next week. But suffice it to say that um, it's more than just gated communities. So the main point here is um, you can have wealthy houses uh, and, well, let's focus on this one. That you have gated communities outside the city, and then you have your freeway connecting to the center uh, of the city and out to similar gated enclaves of entertainment and commercial activity. And then, again, connected uh, by freeway back to your home. And so that's the model. That's the LA model that was imported uh, to Jakarta and other places, where uh, the wealthiest 1% live protected in their gated community, uh, their thematized um, homes. If they actually live in those homes, the occupation rate is somewhere between uh, at the high end, something like 70%, at the low end, more like 10%, uh, or somewhere in between. And the idea is you have your air-conditioned house, you get into your air-conditioned car, get stuck in traffic on your freeway, and go to your air-conditioned, walled-off enclave uh, where you do work and restaurants and entertainment and shopping, and then back to your walled place. And in between, this is what, where the other 99% spend their lives. They don't ever go in here. They don't ever get in their own car to travel on the freeways, and they don't go in here. There are actually security guards at the entry to malls to keep you out if you look like you're not a member of the consumer class, which is what we're calling, what other people call the middle class. Uh, it's more accurate, more precise. Uh, to call it the consumer class. It's the wealthiest 1 to 5 percent who have discretionary income to consume. And so there are guards keeping the wrong people from going into some of the shopping malls. Not all of them. So this is uh, one of my favorite uh, developments outside of Jakarta called Lipo Karawachi. Uh, James Riotti, who is the uh, owner of the company that does this, did his graduate degree in California, spent a lot of time in California, and he's a very flamboyant figure. He loves the United States. He gave a huge amount of money to the Bill Clinton presidential campaign and uh, uh, went to trial because uh, there was a lot of legal ruckus because 
uh, presidential campaigns are not allowed to accept donations from foreign donors. Um, and so there was a big ruckus around the James Rowdy thing. Um, but this is his development. And um, I recommend not using architectural renderings for your analysis because it's not real data. It might be an illustration of the marketing intentions. But what we're looking for in the analysis is not that. It's really what was built and how do we understand what was built. You so the whole area. This is not built this way. It doesn't look like this. But this is the idea. And uh, these are wealthy mansions that are in their own enclaves that are modeled after the palace of the king of Java. So I had a really strong interest in his interpretation of the palace of the king of Java because actually the palace of the king of Java was one of the important uh, places where I focused my research when I lived in Indonesia. And so it was a modern day replica of the walled enclaves of it. So it's walls within walls within walls. Uh, and he was also trying his innovation and actually it was a a good integration. It, it, as things go, this is not a bad idea to have housing and commercial in a university all in one place. So there are a lot of things that are actually quite good from a design and urban design and planning perspective, but it's also more over the top than, uh, than any other project. It's just and we'll look at a few of those in China. So this is the plan view. So these are the enclaves of the extremely wealthy golf course, beautiful uh, country club. Um, there's a, uh, at the time, it was the most luxurious shopping mall in all of uh, Southeast Asia. And in 1997, when this real estate stuff caused the collapse of the economy, the fall of the president, uh, uh, rioters overwhelmed the guards at the main gate and they broke in and they burned the shopping mall. So the fears that are very clear in the walls within the walls and the walls are actually real fears. And even so this I took I did all this before the riots happened. Um, but the idea the marketing idea is by creating a secure walled community out here, you could eliminate walls inside. You don't need walls in here because you put a, a gated, there's only one entrance in and out of this whole place, totally illegal in the United States. But one entrance was the key. And, uh, and so the idea, and I spent some time hanging out with the uh, Scottish um, designer of this of this scheme, he was very disappointed that from a marketing point of view, the people coming in here insisted that there be an additional barrier. If the outer fortress is penetrated by the zombie apocalypse, have you seen The Walking Dead? You had to create further fortifications around every neighborhood. And so in the middle of what was supposed to be this continuous neighborhood, they had to install these fences just to keep things safe. And this is the, uh, the visualization by the California architects who uh, designed Irvine Ranch and gave them a version of it uh, for Indonesia. And 10 years after publi uh, publishing this piece called Orange County Java, a new real estate development emerged. Guess what it's called? Orange County Java. Yes. They don't, they're not paying me royalties. I think they should. Maybe they read my piece and said, great idea. Yeah, 10 years before they did this. Um, OK. So this is what happened starting in the 1970s and 80s in Indonesia. But who cares about Indonesia? Who's ever heard of Indonesia? Is that even a place? Right? Here in the United States, we haven't really 
it doesn't really show up on the radar. Um, but it is the fourth largest country in the world. Who knew? What matters? If we don't care at all about Indonesia, what do we care about? No. China. China is the big, the big dog now. What's the population of China? It's more than that. It's more than a lot. Just guess. One point two trillion. That's right? pretty good. Or billion. Which one is it? Billion. Okay. Yeah, I that would be. Well. It's one point four billion. So that was that was very good. Right. So um, in the 1970s, when Indonesia was producing this wealth on paper by creating where there was zero value of land, they created huge value and built an entire e economic explosion on the value of land. China was still being ruled by Mao Zedong, the, uh, the communist revolutionary of China. No foreign investment, no big banking, communist state socialist control of everything, right? But what happened when Mao died in 76? Everything opened up. Deng Xiaoping uh, invented the open door policy, and in 1979, China opened its doors to the world. My high school took the first public school field trip to China since the revolution. And uh, I really wanted to go, but my parents said, no, $600 is too much. My classmates were on the cover of People magazine. Oh. Could have been me. No, it was Tom Cracky. He, he was the star gymnast of the state champion team. And uh, he was doing a handstand on the edge. He was walking on his hands on the edge of the Great Wall of China. I should show that slide, right? That would. But um, so China said, hey, we need to become a superpower. We used to be a superpower. We were humiliated by the British. We'll talk about that, I think, in the future lecture. We were humiliated by the British in 1840 and 42 um, and later. And um, it's time for us to reemerge and take control of the planet and become the next superpower. We have 1.4 billion people, so why not? And so uh, what do they do? They understand how you create wealth by creating a land market, so that's what they did. And they also understand that if the three biggest global cities of the world are New York, London, and Tokyo, the, mayor of, the governor of Shanghai said, we need Shanghai to be the fourth global hub of, of commerce, of global commerce. And so what do, you, what do you do if you want to make China the next superpower, if you want to make Shanghai the fourth global city? Who, do you, who are you going to call? Architects. Architects. Thank you. So they call the architects. They have a global competition. And what do the architects do? They do a precedent study because they went to the same architecture school that you guys are going to. It's the same education, same as it's ever been. So they, they do a precedent study and they say, OK, we want to make uh, a big global city. So what do we do? Let's, uh, let's uh, take Manhattan and just plop it down. So here's Shanghai. The historic center of Shanghai is the Bund, where Mark Klopfer redesigned the waterfront. Thank you, Professor Klopfer. Um, but these were all rice fields in the 70s. And they said, well, we want this, these rice fields, we want it to be the new global capital of commerce. And so they put down Manhattan and said, what if we just put Manhattan here? What would that look like? Right? Let's put Venice there. What would that look like? 
Paris, they had this very close relationship with Parisian architects. Uh, so several of the entries were from French architects. And they said, well, let's put Paris here. Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower is going to keep showing up this week and next week. And uh, once all these super duper star architects had submitted their competition entries, uh, it turns out that the winning entry was the local Chinese team. It's not necessarily that they had the best scheme, but if you're trying to establish China as the new superpower and Shanghai as the new global hub of commerce, you don't give away the prestigious award to some French architects or to Renzo Piano. You don't give it away to some foreigners you claim that the best architects in the world are Shanghai-based, our, our home team. Yeah. I feel, like, I feel like it wouldn't have mattered who they give it to as long as the people they give it, they gave it to, like, based the architecture off Chinese like, architecture. Chinese architecture or the expectation of the global image of architecture, which is... New York, London, Paris, just like in the real estate developments we looked at in Java, in Jakarta. And so these are the, the competition entries of the foreigners. This tower was already there, the Pearl. Um, and so basically what the Chinese team did is they took the ideas, what they eventually built was taking the best ideas of these other things. It starts with the Champs-Élysées, the widest boulevard of Paris. They said, we're going to put a Champs-Élysées here. If the Champs-Élysées in Paris is 100 meters, you got to outdo it. So you make it 110 meters. And so that's Century Boulevard, the 21st century. 21st century boulevard, the widest boulevard in the world. Wider than the Champs-Élysées. Taller than everything. And so they built it. And um, so this is the old city of Shanghai and uh, the Bund area of the colonial oppression of the 19th century. And then the 21st century uh, capital of commerce, one of the fastest built cities in the world. Three, at the time it was built, it had the three tallest buildings in the world. One fifth of all the cranes in the world were in this one place. So they built it very fast. It was all leveraged money. And uh, did they build it because people wanted to be there? There's Mark Klopfer's Bund. Although the Chinese changed his design when they implemented it, which is what happens when you design for Chinese clients. So there's Pudong over there, the new capital of the world commerce, the, the uh, colonial Bund on this side. So, um, so <laughs> who, who need, was this use value? Was it exchange value? It was also prestige value. This is, um, this is one of the big themes of 20th century architecture is that when countries want to elevate their standing in the world, uh, they use architecture, they build a new capital. And they use architecture to promote their image overseas. And simultaneously, they are establishing their prestige with their own local population. So that they're convincing their own people, back to the pharaoh in Egypt, they're convincing their own people that, that their country is great, and I'm the leader of your country, and I'm making the country great. Um, and so that was a big part of it. But the problem is no one wanted to occupy any of these spaces. So you've heard about China being the new big market for consumer goods uh, that we're producing, that we sell a lot of our stuff to China. They said, you want access to Chinese markets? We will give you access to Chinese markets. But you have to do this, 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 and this. And before we'll open our markets to you. One of the things on their list was you need to lease 400 square, 400 square meters of office space in Pudong. And then 
that's part of the deal. So the American or German or whoever firms would lease space here, but they wouldn't, they don't need it. They wouldn't use it. They would just lease the space. So it's leased, but not occupied. And again, they would have people come and keep it clean. They would pay their rent, uh, but they wouldn't use it. And there was a really awkward moment when I was advising uh, a master's thesis at MIT where um, there were three of us on the students' committee. He was uh, uh, from Thailand, and he's now an anthropologist, uh, really big deal in Australia. Um, and he was studying Shanghai, and he said uh, in his thesis, he was saying that, he was telling the story that the demand for stuff here was an artificially created demand. If people wanted access to Chinese markets, they had to lease space. It was exchange value and symbolic value, not use value. And the chair of the department at the time, the architecture department at MIT, was one of the most prominent Chinese architects of China at the time. And he thought this was just an absolutely ridiculous statement. And it really put the student and me in a difficult place, because here's the chair of the architecture department at MIT. We don't want to upset him, but the evidence suggests that uh, it's not use value. He was insisting that these buildings were built because people need, because the market supported, it was a market-driven supply to satisfy demand. But that's not the case. So when we moved to housing, uh, they built many, many new towns outside of Shanghai, and one of them is Thames Town. Thames Town well, uh, they all have different themes. One is Amsterdam, they replicate Amsterdam. One of them is Florence, they replicate Florence. So we see a, a repetition of all the tricks that we saw in Indonesia that I was able to observe very close at hand in Indonesia. Um, all of those things were being repeated a decade later in uh, China. And so they created uh, this one is particularly interesting because uh, no one lives there. But it's extremely popular for wedding photography. So they create this false landscape with these stores that are actually empty and these houses that are actually empty. And the, they drive in from wherever they're coming from. They, um, they've actually converted some of these stores into changing rooms so the bride can get into her gown. The groom can get dressed. And it's really the backdrop for, it's not a successful real estate development, except everything is owned. Everything has been sold, but no one uses it except the wedding photographers. So it's very strange. Have you heard of the ghost cities of China? I think we have to hear the... Uh, the soundtrack of this. The communist giant's remarkable boom has shielded us here in Australia from the worst of the global economic crisis. Our mineral resources are fueling a rush of urban development across China that is simply mind-boggling. Vast new megacities bigger than London or New York are shooting up all over the country at a rate of 20 a year. But there are disturbing signs that the bubble is about to burst. Take a visit to some of these mega cities and you'll find them bizarrely empty. Brand new, shiny ghost towns. That's Pudong. It's very easy to be overwhelmed by China. A booming nation of 1.3 billion people whose increasingly prosperous lives are driving development on a scale the world has never seen.
Good old. China is constantly on the move. It's estimated that in the next decade, 350 million people will leave the land for the city. It is the largest population movement in human history, and it's leading to the rise and rise of the megacity. And the new version of the architectural the history course will study that to tower. The Entire cities emerge seemingly from nowhere. Well, it's absolutely phenomenal. And when you look at the scale of the cities, Chongqing, 31 and a half million people in Chongqing, it's, and most people have never heard of it. Melbourne architect Robert Caulfield is among the experts who've been invited in by the Chinese. They like his grand designs and have awarded him prized contracts to transform not just a few blocks, but entire cities. Just over in that area there will be the new hub. From sketch to animation to construction. It all happens at dizzying speed. One of our projects, they were actually putting in the roads before we'd even finished the drawings, and uh, we, we just couldn't produce it fast enough. And so as quick as you're drawing it, they're building it. Well, quicker than we were drawing it. <laughs> it's like China Inc. It's like a, a corporation with the five-year plan, everyone going in the one direction. I've had it suggested to me that doing business with the communists is good because they make a decision. Well, they do make decisions. Good it's on. that full throttle philosophy that has transformed cities like Shanghai, no matter what the cost. This is a common sight on old buildings. These red painted characters translated being to be demolished. It won't be long before this block becomes another skyscraper. In the middle of this soaring metropolis, we come across a grand old traditional Chinese house, marked for destruction. Ni hao. Ni hao. <laughs> Good to meet you. So, right, in this segment, they are focusing on uh, the loss of old buildings. But for our purposes, what's more interesting is the evidence of what is the impact of exchange value that produces the architecture in contrast to the use value. And so people are being forced off of agricultural lands, pushed into cities. They're not being pulled into cities so much as being pushed into cities. And they move into these high-rise buildings uh, at, at very low cost. Uh, they, their rents are affordable, their monthly payments are affordable, but they can't afford the electricity bills to run their refrigerator or their washing machines or their TVs. So they have refrigerators, washing machines, and TVs, but there's no electricity because they can't afford it. So they are, you see them doing the laundry out in the stream, which is really a drainage ditch, and fishing. Um, and it's this huge, as he said, the largest movement of humanity in human history. Never before has so many people moved from the land into cities. Um, and with, even with all that movement, you have huge places that are actually still empty. Someday I'll figure out how to do this. Mover, featuring the latest in high tech advance. So these are too high up to work well for analysis. You need lower.
So, um, oh, I hate that. One of the, I mean, the story that's being told that you've, I'm sure you've heard, is that China is booming because it is um, a manufacturing capital of the world. It's, it's making so many things that its economy is booming. But the story that's not being told is how much of the economic boom of China is the result of uh, the emergence of the property market. That if you go from land that is valued at $1 per cubic per square meter and suddenly it's $100 per square meter or $1,000 per square meter, that is an enormous release of capital. To a large extent, that is the bubble that is the Chinese economy. So some economists have pointed at China uh, as at the verge of an economic collapse. And actually, fortunately, the new ruler ha has reached the same conclusion and is trying to gradually bring the economy down so it doesn't collapse all of a sudden. So we see a downturn in predictions of growth for China, 7%, no, not really, it's really 4%, no, maybe it's 3%. Some people suggest it's more close. The real economy is really around 1%. Yeah. So why would they build all that stuff if like, not a lot of people like move in there? Um, because when you build something big, a lot of money moves from one place to another. This gets back to the argument around reflexivity. If, you, if the rules of the game are whoever moves the most money, the fastest, wins. It doesn't matter if that money is real or if it's phantom money. So you create value by changing the valuation of land from $1 a square meter to $1,000 a square meter, and then you move that money somewhere. If you move that money into concrete, then you can tell the story that 10 years from now, this concrete, this real estate, it's real. You can touch it. If you can tell the story convincingly that 10 years from now, this is going to be worth more than it's worth today, then it's off to the races. You have the basis for exchange value. Which brings us to, what's this? Dubai. Dubai. So, um, we don't have time for Dubai. So, Dubai is uh, one of the big stories of the 21st century. Um, these towers, the short version of the story is that these towers were built as investment. Why do we build skyscrapers? Why do we build Hancock Tower, Prudential, and this new condo tower in Boston? house like multiple things in a small area yeah because the uh, the demand drove these towers it's the land is so valuable there's so much demand that the that it's it's valuable enough that it's worth paying for all those elevators and all that structure to stack up the usable square footage up really high uh, because people want to be in downtown Boston that's use value that's real demand in the market that's driving uh, developers to build these towers. Uh, because there's a large population uh, in the Boston metropolitan area, three or four million people, they all want to locate in the center. The land value goes up and uh, the architecture follows the land value. How does that compare to this? It's uh, a desert. There's no water. It's a desert. No one lives there. And Dubai says, basically, the economic activity of Dubai was originally on oil, but that went away. And then it was the Iranian embargo. Everything moving in and out of Iran went through Dubai, and they would take their cut. And then, um, long story short, basically, these towers are exchange value towers. This is a desert. There's no density. There's no, uh, it's really the story that it's trying to tell is that uh, the value of these towers is going to be higher 10 years from now than it is today. Then you have, so those are large investors. The biggest investors in the world now are called sovereign wealth funds. 
And they are sovereign wealth funds because nations, uh, in order to stabilize their economy, they take lots and lots of US dollars and they hold on to it. And that creates a sovereign wealth fund. But they can't just hold on to the money. They have to put it into an investment. So this is a sovereign wealth fund tower. They needed to put their money somewhere. It's so clearly a sovereign wealth fund tower. Um, here you have lots and lots of apartments, so some people live in them. But most of them are just owned but not occupied. Then you have the observation platform. And then you have the elite observation platform. But what happens uh, between here? I think it's the top 280 meters Isn't of the it tower. Is like mechanical space? And it would be mechanical space if there were any mechanical, if there was any mechanical equipment in it. There's not. It's just There's not. It's just empty floors. It's there to hold up the tower. It's there to make it the tallest building in the world. The floor, the footprint of the floors are so small that you can't really do anything. They don't need to do anything. It's, it's not marketable. They're just trying to make a tall tower. Can people go up? The observation tower that uh, your classmates and I went to two years ago is up. I think it's there. But you can pay an extra $60 a person and go to the elite tower. We didn't do that. Um, and the last 280 meters, which is, that's about has the, the height of the Hancock Tower, right? 280 meters? It's 700 feet. I thought I heard a number that was like 30 feet. Yeah, that, well, 30 floors? It's less than yeah, but it's, the Hancock Tower is like here. It's, it's lower than these buildings. So that's maybe a Hancock Tower. But yeah, there's a lot going on here that has nothing to do with use value. And they don't even pretend. Uh, and so Dubai is a giant bubble phenomena. So also an interesting uh, thing to do an analysis of, but hopefully with a, a higher resolution image. Um, so questions or comments? Do you think it's going to collapse? No. Not the building, but like the economy? Yes. The economy will collapse. The building is forever. Yeah. The building is so competent. It's remarkable. Structurally, these really stiff tubes, it's a stacked bundle model. It's brilliant. Who knew that you could do something? And it's got 30 floors of just structure. Just, yeah, well, yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty brilliant structurally. Um, uh, but it's the product of exchange value. So back to the original question that is something worth pondering and re kind of recalibrating uh, our assumptions about the profession of architecture. Um, when is architecture uh, the passive reflection of forces? And when is architecture actually an instrument of those forces? Where the construction of, of the architecture is actually part of the process of capturing wealth, of creating enclaves of exclusion, of making, making that wealth something that displaces people and um, is it an accumulation of money and value that uh, when we saw that income uh, inequality in the world and you saw that the wealth is 300 people have uh, more wealth than the poorest three billion people. That, this is what that wealth looks like. It manifests as architecture. And it makes it, um, and it, it then further displaces people and makes it more expensive for everyone. As a matter of fact, uh, recent press, I was contacted by this, uh, a member of the City Council of Cambridge to help them figure out what's going on on Mass Ave in Cambridge. Because there are storefronts that are owned, but 
they're not open. They're actually, there's no business in these storefronts on Northern Mass Ave. And um, they were talking to me because uh, of this research that um, the people who own, I was asked to consult on a, uh, the design of a dance studio uh, in North Cambridge. And we approached an owner of a property that would have made a great dance studio. And the owner of the property was from Saudi Arabia, uh, did not live in the United States, and was not interested in talking about selling the property. Uh, didn't matter what price we were willing to pay, he just wasn't interested because if he sold this property, he would just have to have, <sighs> buy, find another property to buy. He wasn't interested in renting the property because then he'd have to fix it up. It was a it was kind of a falling apart building. He just didn't want to be bothered. His only purpose was to take, you know, two million dollars, which might be the value of the property, two or three million dollars, and just park it in a place like Cambridge where the economic bubble's not going to burst in Cambridge. In the Great Recession in 2007, the whole country was really deeply impacted. Boston, not so much. Cambridge, not at all. Brookline, not at all. Because there's real, there's real value in Boston with the universities and the biotech and the pharmaceutical industry and the financial sector. Boston is one of the safest investment real estate markets in the world. And this guy from Saudi Arabia knew it. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to get our two or three million dollars to buy the property. He does also he doesn't care about getting rent every every month. He just has to manage it. He's gonna have to have a deal with tenants. He doesn't want to bother with that. All he wants is to park his two or three million dollars in a place that ten years from now will be worth four or five million dollars. That's all I want. You know, if I'm the Saudi investor. I don't care about the city councilor who's concerned that there's no business along Mass Ave. Uh, and the New York Times, and this might be a good hint on where you might look for evidence uh, closer to home, the New York Times a few years ago, I think it was 2017 or 16, did an expose on the new penthouse real estate market in New York City. Have you heard about the new penthouses? So they're selling, all of a sudden they're building and selling uh, penthouses in New York City for five, ten, 15 million, million dollars and they looked at who's buying these these real estate and what they find is a whole list a whole roster of what are they called they're companies they're pass-through entities they're corporations that are formed in order to purchase the penthouses and uh, the the trustees and board of directors of these corporations because of corporate law in the United States, they don't have to disclose who's, who the company is. So it's just a pass-through entity. It's a corporation that owns the apartment. They actually don't live there. No one lives there. And so you have, and there was a recent article called, um, that came out last, about actually a few weeks ago. Um, and they talk about necrotecture. What does the suffix necro mean? Dead. Dead. So their object of study was London. So they talk about, they, they look at uh, the skyline of London, all the new luxury residential towers, and they look, they count how many lights, you know, they, they keep a record of when the lights are on and when the lights are off. And they notice that in the most expensive real estate in London, in the skyline, the lights are off. And they actually went into the utility bills. And they find that the utility bills for a lot of the most expensive architecture, most expensive real estate in London, uh, the, the utility bills are close to zero. There's just no one living in these units. They are just sitting there empty. And when someone buys uh, an apartment the way the market forces work is if this is the curve of the most expensive real estate, if the horizontal, if the vertical is the number of units and the horizontal is the value of those units, if someone buys um, 
an apartment for thirty million dollars, it it's so much value that uh, the market response is to shift this entire bump over. It's so much money that it has a disproportionate impact on the entire market. So when uh, when a Chinese billionaire buys uh, a, the the apartments in the top floor of the uh, condominium tower that Cambridge Seven is completing now. That you see the, it's Boston's third tower with the crane. Dalton. Is that it? One Dalton. One Dalton. So when foreign billionaires are purchasing the top floors of those apartments, it doesn't affect you, does it? Your rent next year will be set by the shifting of the curve that is caused by the sales at the very top of the curve. That's how market forces work in real estate. Uh, so even, even though you're renting, you're not, you don't own your place. If you owned your place, you'd say, thank you very much. The value of my home just went up. I say thank you very much. I get to mortgage my house for even more money and go into debt even deeper in order to fund my two children's college tuition. Thank you very much, uh, billionaires, buying real estate and not living here. But do you own real estate? No. What happens to you? You, you go, oh, you feel it. You'll feel it next year when your rent goes up. Ten or, you know, it might be $10, but eventually, if you do that enough, the entire market shifts, and it it creates uh, hardship for everybody whose rents are going, who doesn't own. Even for those who do own, um, the property taxes and the condo fees all go up with uh, in parallel to the value. So this is uh, something that impacts everybody. Who knew, right? Who knew that this was even part of architecture? But it is. So what do we do? Well, it's interesting. There are about a dozen thesis projects that are designing within a context that they created. And in order to do the design work that they want to do, and most of them have to do with housing affordability, they write in their thesis books because they're doing thesis books. They write in their thesis books some version of the story. Um, the city of Boston has purchased the property uh, that they're designing and put it into a land trust. So the value of the land has actually been removed from the economic equation that sets the price. And then and only then can they actually pursue this question of housing affordability as a design question. They have to come up with this financial narrative that isolates the property from the market forces that are distorting everything. So it's a really interesting fundamental foundation for the design work that they're doing in thesis. You have to know a little bit about markets and the impact on architecture to even engage in the process of exploring affordable housing. Is everybody okay? Sometimes this class can be a little upsetting. I understand. Um, you should talk with your friends. Um, everything's going to be okay. Well, because you're going to figure it out, and you're going to do something about it. Okay. So, any questions about the assignment for Wednesday? Do you have any ideas about what you're going to look at? Could be New York, could be Boston, could be, uh, but the clear evidence of places like this, <laughs> Dubai, Shanghai, Abu Dhabi, Beijing, uh, Bangkok, uh, any capital city of any country in the global south, could be Lusaka, could be Nairobi. You know, if you were looking at Kibera for informal settlements, you might want to stick with Nairobi and look at the high-rise 
condominium towers uh, in Nairobi, or the luxury uh, gated communities where it looks like Southern California outside of Nairobi. Because I, I haven't been, I haven't looked for uh, luxury subdivisions uh, that look like Southern California outside of Nairobi, but I'll bet you they're there. We know these, these economic forces are commonly spread across the planet and outside of every major city in the world, you will find luxury uh, subdivisions going up on the, the uh, model of Southern California. And uh, India, because English is a language in India, they market their condominium towers based on London, you know, Briarcliff, Cable Manor, it's all, uh, uh, what's the, uh, what's the miniseries that was in England, the HBO miniseries, Downton Abbey. I bet there's real estate called Downton Abbey because it was such a popular uh, media uh, movie phenomena that uh, it, it gets translated very directly into real estate. And then next week, we'll be looking at how that happened in the United States before it spread overseas. Okay? That's enough.